Grundig, a company founded in West Germany in 1945, right after World War II, has for decades deservedly so enjoyed a reputation as one of the most innovative and highest quality brands when it comes to audio and video. They made one of the first tubeless radios, a first ultrasound remote controller, a color TV in 1969, two years after the standard was announced, digital screen radio watch, one of the first 100Hz TVs, and a bunch of other innovations and early technology implementations, so it's no wonder that this brand is a fond memory for many slightly older users, especially those who had one of those products back in their golden age between 1960s and 1980s. In the early 2000s, the consumer electronics market was rapidly changing and many companies had trouble adapting, so Grundig eventually ended up as a part of Turkish Archelik, a company which also owns a popular Beko brand. We've had a chance to try out some of the newer Grundig TVs in the last couple of years, and while they were decent for the money, we can't quite say that they lived up to the reputation that this brand had in their heyday. People over at Archelic were of course aware of this, so the company opened a new factory this year and released some new models which promise a big change over what we have previously seen from them. Usually when we get an announcement for some new product to test, it's most often followed by the same story on how much was changed and improved, so we kind of expected this to be the same and perhaps just a slight evolution over the previous models. I'm glad to admit that we were wrong and that Grundig has really made some fundamental changes. First of which is the design, which is far more modern, but most importantly distinctive and unique, just what we expect to see from a brand known for its innovations. The star of the show in this case is the stand that is made of a metal bar which is bent into a shape that extends on the front and the back. The shape may remind you of some stands that you have previously seen, except in this case it is super thin, only about 10 mm and looks unusual, plus it is impressively strong and sturdy, so kudos to Grundig for the idea and the implementation. The stand color is made grey, the same as the panel frame, except that the frame is made of plastic and consists of two parts, one that surrounds the sides and the top and one on the bottom, both with brushed metal texture. In order to achieve proper firmness, which they did, Grundig made the frame slightly thicker, but it still fits the design just fine. If the frame had been also made of metal, this model would get 10 out of 10 for looks and build quality, but perhaps that was reserved for some upper class Grundig model. Another thing that we liked was the sound solution, which is located under the bottom edge of the panel, covered in firm cloth and shaped so that it gives a very interesting visual effect and texture. It really is a nice looking TV, but let us know if you agree with that. The back of the TV is made of hard plastic and looks simple with two surfaces that are separated by a vent. The upper one has a sandblasted texture, the bottom one a brushed texture. On the back you'll also find the connectors, which are separated into two sections. One oriented towards the sides holds only the essentials. One HDMI, a USB 2.0 port, a headphone jack and a CI Plus slot, while a larger one oriented downwards holds another two HDMI ports, a USB with one ampere which can power an external hard drive, antenna and satellite connectors, a LAN port and an optical audio output. HDMI ports are version 2.1 as per specs, but the only supported 2.1 function is the EARC. 120Hz is of course absent since the panel is only 60Hz, but there's also no sign of variable refresh rate or auto low latency mode. The one to blame for this is the HDMI forum which governs the standard and has recently decided to certify all devices as HDMI 2.1 even if they have only 2.0 capabilities, which promises a lot of confusion but that's a whole different discussion. On the plus side, input lag on HDMI ports was measured at only 10.6 milliseconds in game mode, which is a very good score, so this TV is a good choice for gaming on a large screen, at least if you don't need more than 4K at 60Hz, but realistically you can't get more than that at this price, about 590 euro for 55 inches. As for the panel, Grundig has opted to use IPS combined with direct LED backlight and no local dimming. The panel offers excellent viewing angles as expected, a decent uniformity with a bit of vignetting in corners, but with a slight backlight bleeding along the part of the top edge which you may notice when you're watching something in the dark room. The strong point of this panel is the unusually high static contrast that we measured at 1370 to 1, which is in the upper range for this type of panel and has a positive impact on the subjective picture quality. The panel displays 10 bits per color channel with the help of FRC, but according to our measurements covers only around 65.4% of DCI-P3 gamut, so no wide color gamut for HDR. 
color display is fairly vivid though, as we often see on IPS models. As for the color accuracy, the best we've measured was in movie mode with a decent delta E deviation of 3.7, while other picture modes, six of each in SDR and HDR, are more oriented towards displaying a more attractive rather than faithful looking image. The panel and calibration are only a part of the equation though, since image processing plays an important role in the overall impression. The good news is that on this model, unlike some previous ones, Grundig has implemented a much more advanced image processing, including MEMC capabilities or motion processing. The quality of MEMC is not quite on the same level as on a few leading brands models, but I'd say it is very decent for displaying 24 FPS content like movies, which is what it is most useful for anyway. Unlike some solutions with the judder and the blur sliders, here you can only select one of the three preset levels, and we prefer to use the medium one as it is fairly subtle but manages to do a nice job of removing the judder. The high setting was not much better than medium and does not offer the smoothness of the so-called soap opera effect. Additional image processing features include dynamic contrast which adjusts backlight brightness depending on the scene in order to use the available contrast in the best way possible. This can raise the effective contrast to 3900 to 1, but of course not within the single scene. Besides that, the TV also features an ambient light sensor, which is unusual in this class, which can adjust the brightness during the day and night to make the image more pleasant for the eyes. The TV supports Dolby Vision and HDR10 HDR formats with dynamic metadata per scene, but it's not clear if, since it has a light sensor, it also supports HDR10 Adaptive and Dolby Vision IQ, which also take into account the room's ambient light. Either way, since the maximum measured brightness was 318 nits in HDR mode, you shouldn't expect real HDR from this model anyway, or any similarly priced one for that matter, but it's nice to see that it supports all those features. Speaking of HDR, there's also a Max Vivid feature, which is something like HDR effect available only for SDR content, plus a feature for reducing the blue light, and an option that improves the color transients that actually does a decent job and makes transitions between different shades smoother. Overall, a solid image quality and rich image processing features, not unique in this class, but some of the mentioned options in the similar price range are only available on Hisense A7 GQ and Samsung's TU7 series, each with some advantages of their own. Speaking of advantages, the sound of this model is a pleasant surprise and we can say that it is one of the best in its class. The frequency balance is very decent, bass extends to a bit below 60Hz, though after 100Hz it slowly drops off in volume, but in any case there is enough to give the sound some weight that we rarely see in this price range, and that is a very welcome addition for a better enjoyment when it comes to movies and music. With 2 times 10 watts, it is fairly loud, and just like with the image, there's plenty of sound processing features too. A 5-band equalizer, separate bass and treble sliders, surround processing which subtly improves the sound stage, and DTS Virtual X processing. This last one gives the sound a bit of flavor that we actually liked on this model, while we can say the same for its two sub-options, TBHDX and Limiter, which we felt had a negative impact on clarity and transients. One of the strongest points of this model are its smart features, since it is based on version 11 of Android TV platform, the official one with full support for Google Play Store, Netflix and anything else you might expect from Android. Android TV may not offer as refined a user experience as Samsung's Tizen or LG's WebOS, but it is still the most capable smart TV platform by far, with a huge number of supported apps and the best selection of games. We should note that Android TV's App Store does not contain all the Android apps you may see on your mobile phone, but only those apps that can be used without a touchscreen, which is still a respectable selection with some exclusives like Kodi for instance that you won't find on other platforms. You also get practically all the relevant audio and video streaming services, Steam Link for those of you that like to play PC games on a big screen in their living room, plus of course Chromecast so you can display things from your mobile phone on your TV. As for the interface, Grundig did not stray from what Google has designed, so you get horizontal lines with installed apps and content suggestions from installed video services. TV's menu and sound and video options are integrated within the Android menu, but you do get a quick menu which you can invoke via a key from within any app or content and change settings. A useful and even necessary detail that we do not get on many Android models. 
Like many Android TVs, Grundig GGU 79502A is powered by a MediaTek chipset, but in this case it is MT7632 instead of 7322, but with 2GB of RAM and 10.89GB of storage, which is plenty even for large games like Asphalt, with all the additional content. It is good that Grundig did not skimp on the storage, cause this way the TV is much more usable, especially for games. Speaking of which, the performance in demanding Android 3D games is decent, although not better than average, which we were kind of expecting due to the newer chipset. In any case, if you connect a pair of Bluetooth gamepads, you can have some fun just fine. As for the interface speed, it is good enough, so no complaints there. The TV can be controlled via an interestingly designed remote, which is unusually shaped, but is quite handy with quality keys with short travel and a click. Only downside is that the remote does not support voice control, but if you need that, you can use the mobile app instead. All in all, Grundig GGU 7950A is a well-rounded TV, which offers a solid image quality for its class, a lot of processing options, very good sound and capable software with plenty of possibilities, along with very pleasant and unique design. The price of this model is around 500 euro for 50 inches, 590 euro for 55 inches and 760 euro for 65 inches, which is fair considering everything it has to offer. That would be all for this review, but we would like to hear your opinion as well, so please share your thoughts on this TV in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and maybe consider subscribing to our channel for more interesting tech content. You are watching Bench House, my name is Ivan and I'll see you next time.